Welcome everybody. Uh, it's a real pleasure to have this uh, panel discussion uh, with, uh, with Harold. And uh, we're going to structure this in the following way. And hopefully this will deal with the very large number of questions that people continue to have for you, including from the panel, uh, and the many perspectives that I know you want to hear from the panel on the question of multidisciplinarity and art and politics um, relative to science. So um, the uh, rough structure of this will be as follows. Our panelists will speak, everyone will speak for five to 10 minutes each. Uh, before we begin, I'll introduce myself and the panel. Um, so that hopefully uh, we'll build a sense of excitement about each of the panelists and why we want to hear from them. Um, I will ask each panelist to speak um, in an order that we just sort of figured out between ourselves before we came here and um, uh, ask them questions. But many of them also have questions for Harold, right? So they'll be talking about their perspective on some of these things and they'd like to hear your perspective. So I think uh, everybody should the collectively take about half an hour and then we will revert to Harold for uh, uh, and ask you uh, what you think about some of the questions that they have raised. That will go on for about 10 minutes or so and so about 40 minutes in we will open this up for questions from the audience and your questions can be directed to Harold, they can be directed to the panel and we'll have about 20 minutes for that interaction. Um, I say this knowing full well that there, there may be some running over here and there, and it's going to be tricky to fit in so many perspectives in an hour, but we'll do our best to try and stick to time. I'm very impressed with the anticipated endurance of the audience. <laughs> <laughs> well, I did a quick check in about <laughs> endurance for you because I know that everybody's been here for an hour and a half. And yeah. uh, we know, uh, especially we, we teach classes that are an hour and a half long. And so you can start to see kind of the interest <laughs> and the engagement and <laughs> the, the sort of uh, state of engagement of students dwindle by about 45 minutes. Uh, and then there's sort of a second wind that kicks in for the next, uh, <laughs> you know, 45 minutes of the class. So you're right. Uh, this is a bit of an endurance test uh, <laughs> uh, for, for all of you, actually. Okay. Uh, so hopefully you will be sustained and nourished by tea, which I believe will follow after uh, the panel. So we will stop at 6.30 in the interests of nourishing people uh, who will, uh, you know, be at an uh, sort of energy low by the end of, uh, <laughs> of this program. Well, as my <laughs> colleague Mark Patashny likes to say, it's easier to talk than to listen. <laughs> yeah, yeah. In, in, in many ways. Yeah. I think students would very much <laughs> agree with that. <laughs> Okay, so um, I'm Bitu. I'm an associate professor of biology and psychology. My pronouns are he and they, and it gives me great pleasure to introduce the panel. So we will first be hearing um, from Simona, who is an um, associate professor of literature at IIT Delhi um, in the School of Humanities and Social Sciences, uh, but also somebody whose interests lie in political uh, and psychoanalytic theory. Uh, and so um, we are especially interested in, in listening to her views on art and politics um, relative to science. Uh, our second speaker will be Ayush Mistri, who is a fourth year undergraduate with a major in biology uh, and a second major. Uh, he's now pursuing a second major in political science um, alongside his advanced major in biology. His interests lie in cancer research and public policy. So he uh, also has questions uh, for you. Uh, as you can see, his interests relate. Um, our third panelist will be Soiza. Uh, Soiza is a fourth year anthropology uh, and China studies uh, major uh, and is interested in medical anthropology and how power works in science and scientific research. Our fourth panelist will be Nanjo. Uh, and uh, Nayanjot Lahari is a, is a professor of um, uh, history at Ashoka, uh, whom all of you know um, and uh, very well. Uh, she taught for two decades at Delhi University before coming to Ashoka University and has built a career um, studying India's past, um, uh, especially from uh, an archaeological uh, uh, you know, vantage point. And so uh, we hope that she will also share her insights on, on building um, uh, this very interdisciplinary field, but sort of the challenges and the, the, the difficulties in, in doing that um, relative to incentive structures in academia. 
Um, and then our last panelist will be Sushi, who uh, is an ASP, a fourth year biology student um, in uh, the Neurothology Lab. And uh, she's an artist, uh, they're an artist and activist uh, who work on questions of disability, gender, and open science. So um, uh, they will also have a lot of questions for you. Um, and uh, we will end with them and then you will you can freshly engage with both Sushi's questions and with the questions raised by um, uh, by Ayush and Nainjot um, as well. Very good evening. Um, I'm absolutely delighted to be on the same panel as Professor Omas and the rest of my panelists. So thank you very much, Professor Shashi, for the offer. Um, through my undergrad education in political science and biology, I've just been continually fascinated by how seemingly distant disciplines can converge to a point where you can tackle challenging problems using innovative solutions. And uh, by the medium of this panel, I am really excited to A, learn more and perhaps share my own experiences and thoughts as a student and as someone who aspires to operate at the intersection of teaching, research, and policymaking. Um, as we sort of discuss the values and importance of multidisciplinary approaches, I am hopeful that the discussion can perhaps uh, touch upon a few aspects that I consider are critical to the discourse. Uh, these range from the politicization of science and how politics can influence and infiltrate the production of scientific knowledge, the processes of scientific practice, um, the maintenance of a fine balancing act, as Professor Wormus would perhaps best agree, uh, when you operate at an intersection of science and policy making, and perhaps regulate how information flows, the bi-directional flow of information between the two realms. Um, upholding empiricism and objectivity within the political realms, which I feel are two crucial tenets to rigorous scientific practice. And I don't see any harm in why they shouldn't be upheld uh, within the political sphere, but we seldom see that happening. Um, the question of where scientists and perhaps journals draw the line when it comes to engaging with aspects of politics, uh, you know, taking a very ripe example of the journal Nature, having gone on to be vocally uh, political on aspects of women's education and social issues up until the Second World War, which because of logistical reasons, they had gone to only focus strictly on science. But there's a lot of discourse now that discourages or is perhaps critical of the engagement of journals on political matters. So I'd be glad if we could touch upon that as well as part of the discussion. And finally, how I feel science communication and scientific literacy within society are perhaps the most important mediators in helping flesh out the intricacies uh, of this nexus of science, society, and politics. As a panelist, I hope to contribute in a productive manner to the discussion and explore how multidisciplinary approaches can help bridge certain divides and perhaps find a common ground in this increasingly polarized and complex world. Uh, that'll be my time. I look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much. Science is, uh, as you said, uh, inevitably political. Um, and um, this is, you know, even if often scientists um, who are not interested or invested in um, uh, this lens, uh, often scientists wish to ignore the inevitable politicization of science. Um, and so, um, and con you know, in, in uh, taking this sort of question forward, Soiza will be um, uh, talking about power um, and science, power being often the crucial unexamined question, both in a liberal arts framework and uh, from, uh, the, the, from sort of the question of how uh, science policy works. Uh, often power is not centered in this discussion. So uh, Soiza will be addressing this. I'd like to talk about the convoluted and interconnected histories of both science and anthropology. Um, so oftentimes in STEM departments, the notion of scientific objectivity is 
He used to mask the biases and power relations that exist in science. Science, just like all academic disciplines, is not void of is not void of biases or power as much as we would uh, like to believe otherwise. Failing to recognize science or any academic discipline as political and thinking of it as existing in a vacuum outside of politics or culture is not only a ridiculous but rather dangerous idea. And this position is actively rewriting and erasing the violent histories of both science and other academic disciplines. Historically, scientists and anthropologists have worked in collaboration for the colonial project and have been complicit in genocide of various indigenous communities. Um, the biases of science, scientists have often colored their research and a lot of scientists have used science to justify and explain away oppressive systems like white supremacy, colonialism, sexism, ableism, and so on. And as scientists and anthropologists, we rarely interrogate the often deeply violent histories of our own disciplines. And this reflects in the new technologies and the research that we are currently doing, which are also perpetuating similar racial and gendered ideologies. Um, so there is a long history of scientists invoking science to support racist and oppressive ideologies. For example, a German doctor and anthropologist um, Johann Blumenbach, who was the first person to characterize the five human races based on region, and his work still deeply informs our understanding of the correlation between race and intelligence. Um, and while Research has repeatedly shown that race is not a scientifically valid concept. The characteristics that have come to define our popular understanding of race, like hair texture, skin color, facial features, represent only a few of the thousands of traits that define us as a species. Yet, despite its lack of scientific rigor or reproducibility, this reliance on race as a biological concept persists in fields from genetics to medicine. The consequences of that reliance have ranged from justifications for school and housing segregation to support for the uh, transatlantic slave trade of the 16th to 19th centuries, genocidal policies against in indigenous communities around the world, and the Holocaust. So, my question for Professor Varmus and everybody here is that, like, how do we reconcile with these deeply, deeply violent histories of our disciplines and the effects that they have had on millions of people all over the world? Is there a way to rethink? and alter our disciplines as well as our methodologies so that we do not perpetuate similar systems of violence through our research now. Thank you. I really enjoyed your talk, Professor Vermus, and I enjoyed your book even more. I must say I used the free version, which you have encouraged others to use. Um, so. I'm going to make a couple of comments and ask you a couple of questions, drawing upon what you have said about your life and career, and also bring in something relating to my own. Um, the one thing which struck me um, about your book was the manner in which you so uh, interestingly and masterfully, I would say, uh, woven, uh, you know, fortuitous circumstances with many decisions that you yourself took. So, uh, you know, going to a summer camp in Putney uh, and then two summer and then writing after that and two summer camps later, uh, collaring a young professor to teach a group of you, uh, James Joyce, uh, choosing Amherst, so, uh, you know, which has, as was, you know, you pointed out, has, you know, uh, Ashoka has in a way taken to that structure where everybody studies, uh, you know, particular kinds of uh, courses, regardless of whether you're a science student or a humanities student. Um, 
the fact that um, you constantly show the similarities as you see them between the sciences and uh, literature, uh, the fact that imagination is so important both to the science and to the humanities in uh, interpretation and that actually grappling with uh, you know a closed textual reading is not very different from uh, you know crunching hard uh, scientific uh, data now i think as you yourself have pointed out that you have the privilege of being in the us which uh, in a sense allows the kind of prolonged adolescence that you had and late career choices. But, um, you know, what about other parts of the world? You know, what would you be your <laughs> advice to young researchers? There was one here who asked you some very interesting questions, which actually, so, you know, what I'm trying to say is that Ashoka can build a liberal arts um, institution. It can be, uh, you know, the archetype of what a good liberal arts university should be. But at the same time, institutionally, beyond Ashoka, we do not have a larger ecosystem which rewards late career choices and so on and so forth. So it's, uh, you know, I think it's very important that liberal arts institutions are coming up. And I must add here that this is a very new phenomenon. It's, uh, it's a 21st century phenomenon in India. It does not have the kind of history that, uh, you know, you have for uh, multidisciplinarity and, you know, through osmosis going from one discipline, as you did, from literature to uh, medicine to uh, experimental science and so on and so forth. So, you know, there are many uh, very distinguished scientists in the audience and they might also want to, uh, you know, comment on this. Uh, the second point is that the kind of switch that was made by you from literature, to, you know, and then eventually landing up to do great experimental science. Uh, I'm just wondering, and this is also a question for the scientists here, how many uh, top-notch scientists have actually moved? You gave the example of your colleague, Bishop, you know, who had similar interests, but how many have actually uh, moved from, uh, let's say, history and literature to doing, uh, you know, great science? It happens in the US, I imagine, but I'm sure as scientists, you would be able to give some other examples of that to us because I think to create an ecosystem where, uh, you know, you take interdisciplinarity and multidisciplinarity seriously, uh, you need to have great role models. And, uh, you know, Harmal Vamos is a great role model, but it would also be uh, to know about, uh, you know, other such role models. Now, talking about uh, interdisciplinarity in my own life. So I did my PhD and I taught for many, many years at the University of Delhi. My PhD was on the archaeology of Indian trade routes. And I think it would have enormously benefited from having a scientist there because I was looking at the use of raw materials and so on and so forth across cultures on my committee. But there was no question in Delhi University, if you did a PhD thesis from the Department of History, you know, you got an archaeologist who was, you know, who was a member of the history department, but you didn't have people even from your own university being uh, on your advisory committee. Now, Ashoka in that sense is very different because it facilitates, uh, you know, and it follows the kind of model that you have in the US where you actually encourage students to have and you know uh, the primary advisors think this through very carefully and bring others uh, in to help students as uh, you know much as they can and i came from this you know government funded university to ashoka and 
I was doing my teaching and my research and so on. And then came the scientists who said that, hang on, the biologists especially, who said that, why don't you think of setting up an interdisciplinary uh, center of archaeological research? Now, this is possible in a liberal arts uh, university, but liberal arts universities are very few at the moment. And in the larger, uh, you know, educational uh, system, you simply do not have uh, this kind of straight jacketing breaking down. You don't find uh, biologists and uh, historians and archaeologists teaching the same course as you do in Ashoka in many other places. So, I mean, I'm just trying to say that the context of India is uh, different, and there's a lot that can be gained from, you know, what one sees in the U.S. Hello, Professor Vamas. Um, hello, I'm Sushmata. My pronouns are they and she. I'm grateful to Professor Shashidara for providing me with the opportunity to be on this panel with Professor Vamas and the rest of the panelists here. Today, I'm a fourth year student in the Ashoka Scholars Program majoring in biology and working in the Neurothology Lab. I am passionate about disability justice and improving accessibility in academic spaces, as well as making scientific research more open source and accessible. Um, in addition, I also dabble in art in my spare time and I'm invested in exploring the use of artistic practice as a tool of political dissent. Um, a liberal arts curriculum allows me to engage with my scientific interests while exploring the intersections of identity with various socio-political spheres to figure myself out and understand the world around me better. I've always been understanding, uh, I've, I've always been fascinated with understanding the human aspect of science, that is the people behind the science itself and how these people, you know, make science happen through the scientific method. Uh, I believe it's important to be sensitive and informed as a human being, especially so when one also does science, just as doctors are taught the importance of uh, bedside matter while tending to their patients. Um, so uh, I've also been very interested in how uh, uh, people come together to make science happen in collaborative environments uh, and how things are a team effort. So uh, I have two questions for Professor Vamas today. Uh, how does one improve uh, the transparency and the collaborative nature of scientific research while awarding coveted prizes like the Nobel uh, considering that the Nobel Prize has a maximum of three recipients, which has been modified from Alfred Nobel's initial will of one recipient that is the best in their field. So now that the, the rules have already been modified uh, to a certain extent to accommodate for more winners, uh, why uh, can we not go ahead and uh, acknowledge uh, organizations or labs instead of individuals like the Nobel Peace Prize does, for instance. And my second question is, uh, Professor Vamas, you spearheaded the creation of the Free Public Digital Repository, PubMed Central and PLOS. Um, in a digital landscape where uh, a, a majority of the uh, uh, scientific articles available are behind paywalls, uh, what do you think of um, Sci Hub, that is by Alexandra Elbakian. Like, what is your opinion of the pirate herself? Um, Thank you. I am desisting oh. for now. Yes, I'm being a good moderator and not uh, <laughs> contributing my opinion. But, uh, but I think uh, really all of the panelists have raised. I think all of the questions that I would have and all of the, the points of engagement that I think um, matter to this discourse. So I'm, I'm really excited to hear your response. I know you. it's been a bit of a deluge of questions. So uh, yeah, uh, in any order that you like or in any way that you'd like to respond. I actually thought we were going to talk about uh, um, a multidisciplinary education that is. All right. So um, what I expected to have happen here, and I'll just say a little bit about that, is that I thought we were going to talk about the underlying theme of Ashoka, which is the idea that 
that people should be educated in many different disciplines and that uh, the, and the, the relevance of, of an education where you learn many things and don't simply do what they do in England, which is start to be a medical student at the age of 17, which I think is a huge mistake. Um, but it's clear that there are lots of ways to think about the problem that has been raised by this panel. And uh, I want to talk, I want to address a few of them uh, because they do range from um, you know, how science works to how society works and how we define what science does. And, but I'm going to start, um, one problem I have is I don't, I don't, I didn't get all the names. In fact, I wouldn't say I got all the, any of the names, but I'm going to, I'm going to, no, it's all right. Um, I'm going to start by taking on a couple of things that you just said. What's your first name? Sushi. Sushi. Sushi okay. Um, that uh, address problems that I can, I think I can address fairly quickly. Um, you asked about my attitude toward piracy and basically stealing um, publications and making them available to everybody. And I think that is useful in one sense, because I think sometimes um, a certain kind of illegal activity demonstrates the importance of, count of countering standard behavior. But I don't overall endorse the idea of being a pirate and stealing things. I do think it's, it's more important to change the way things are done in a standard way. And I think what we finally have come to in the world of publication is um, a time when people who pay for science, that is governments, funders, um, citizens who, who have paid taxes, have realized that, that, that they don't want to pay for the science twice. They've paid for the doing of it, and they don't want to pay to, to see the results. And uh, the, the initiatives that have been, um, that have been uh, now endorsed by science funders, such as Plan S in Europe, um, the, the recent decision by, even in the US, that uh, the Office of Science and Technology Policy is saying, the government pays for the science has got to be made available. But those things are now happening. And within the next two years, I believe that we will have forced all publishers to adopt policies that make science available to everybody. There still are some remaining problems here. One is that the science has real costs and science publishing has real costs. And we've got to pay those. The costs are minimal compared to the science itself. The estimate is that only one to two percent of the cost of of uh, public, the, only one to two percent of the cost of the science is entailed in making the scientific work available through um, formatting and and uh, and reviewing the other things that are a real cost of science. So I do think that this problem is going to be solved. It took twenty five years. Maybe in the in terms of human history, that's not so bad. But I do think we're reaching the end point, and we won't have to publicly endorse piracy any longer. Um, the second thing I wanted to raise was that it's a, it's, it's a problem I can, I can encompass and try to answer in a direct way is this issue of prizes. Um, I, I feel myself ambivalent about prizes. Um, and of course, uh, I'm in a position to say, gee, prizes are great because they, they, they definitely enhance my own life. But um, I don't feel that way about them in general. But I do think that they serve one very useful purpose, which is to educate people about what science has achieved. And I think um, the prizes that do attract a lot of attention, the Lasker Prize in the US, the Nobel Prize throughout the world, has given scientists a chance to articulate in, a, in an intelligible way uh, what, what we've been doing with all that money. And that we've done things uh, you know, some of the prizes that have been given, for example, to people who've done work that have allowed um, the production of uh, effective coronavirus vaccines has really allowed people to understand that vaccines do don't just drop from the sky, that they require advances in fundamental science before they happen. You raised an important point about individuals being recognized as opposed to teams. And I think this is still a struggle 
um, because uh, I, I see this from the perspective of someone who's received prizes and someone who's served on prize juries. Um, serving on prize juries is a challenge when you have a limit to the number of recipients, um, but it's a challenge that really helps the jurors select the people who are most deserving. The more important point I'm gonna make is about the, your proposal about teams. And we've struggled with this over the years because if you wanna give a prize to a company, for example, that's done something fundamental like develop a human papillomavirus vaccine or, um, or made some other advance, it's hard to do that without recognizing teams. And yet teams are in general not allowed by these prizes. I'm now fun, uh, chairing a, a jury for a new prize for development of medical technologies that have benefited people. And we're, take, we're doing an experiment. We're gonna allow teams. Nobody's named. Um, teams can be a, you know, def, def, defined by uh, the group leader or the company manager. And we'll see uh, this new prize, which is <coughs> called the Merkin Prize actually functions, but I think it's an experiment <coughs> worth trying because I think we can, we can help illustrate that science is often a, a team effort um, without having to name the 42 members of the team. Um, and I'm hoping that'll illustrate to the public <coughs> that, that, that science is not just done by individuals. Not a perfect solution, but step forward. <coughs> One of the ways, <clears throat> and one of the things that I heard, I heard two big issues come up in many of the comments. One is an issue of equity, and uh, that is who can do science and who benefits from science. And this is a huge issue, which um, has become a much more important issue in the U.S. over the last few years, because I think we're giving more attention to, especially to racial inequities, uh, in our society, um, the George Floyd uh, catastrophe and and uh, the the outcomes of patients who are of different um, uh, ancestries, different racial groups, uh, and and areas of chronic disease like cancer. Oh, thank you. Or, or um, have had less good outcomes in the corona and in the in the, in the um, COVID. Uh, pandemic uh, have brought these issues to greater public attention. Um, I've been personally very concerned about the apparent um, lack of access to the conduct of science to black and Hispanic students in, 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 um, in our country. And while I don't have a simple answer, um, a group of us recently wrote an article in Science Magazine outlining some of the things that have been effective experiments in the U.S. to make science a more equitable profession. And um, it's not easy because <clears throat> we, we have created a lot of impediments to entry into science if you don't come from a wealthy background. Science, <clears throat> is a, as I said at one point during my talk, <clears throat> has become high, highly competitive. Many people enter the profession and then find that they can't get grants, they can't keep their jobs. Um, and if you don't have family money, it's very difficult to, to, to operate and do the things, you know, get the, the salary support for living that you need. And um, so uh, what we're arguing is that uh, some of the barriers to, to whoa, that, that's great. Hey, but some of the barriers to entry can be overcome by having uh, programs that that uh, that give special consideration to people who come from very poor backgrounds. It's not just about race; it's also about uh, socioeconomic status. And uh, we, but we know that uh, uh, less than a couple of percent of of uh, scientists in America are black. Um, less than five percent are Hispanic, and yet. Those are the population groups that are growing most rapidly in the U.S., especially Hispanics. And if we don't encourage um, using financial resources and, and something that I, you can call it increased opportunity, you can call it uh, um, 
kind of favoritism. You can call it uh, there are a lot of names that don't some people don't like, but but providing extra resources and extra opportunities and inducements and encouragements um, to people who are underrepresented in the sciences is going to lead to depletion of our of our talent pool because talent is everywhere and you simply have to find ways to encourage people who have those talents to take up scientific work otherwise uh, science in America is going to be in big trouble uh, we have a Supreme Court case that is <clears throat> under consideration will be um, uh, the verdict will be delivered uh, probably at the end of next year in the June sorry June the end of the court year um, about affirmative action and without affirmative action of some kind uh, we're in big trouble in the US because we're not going to be giving opportunities to black and Hispanic youth who uh, who have the talent and the inclination to become scientists. Uh, there are programs that do work. There's a program at the University of, of, ba of Maryland, Baltimore County called the Meyerhoff Program, which provides black and Hispanic students who are interested in, uh, in being scientists, engineers, and physicians uh, with the opportunity to, to attend college at no cost to interact with a group of peers. Um, people think it's just about the money and the admission, but it's not. It's about how, what, under what circumstances do you get trained? Um, um, one of the reasons that, uh, that many Asian students do very well in, in college science programs is because they know how to, they're, they're trained and cultured to study together. And uh, the building groups of, of like-minded people, similar backgrounds who study together uh, has gone a long way to, to, to promoting uh, the adoption of scientific careers by, uh, by at least this one school. And a number of organizations, Howard Hughes Medical Institute and others, have tried to follow that lead and build similar programs elsewhere. We'll see how it works out. But um, I think the issue that's been raised about who does science and what kind of equity is in the system is something that we, I don't have a simple answer to, but it, it's, I think it's pr important to distinguish it from simply doing multidisciplinary research. This issue about hospitality to the, to the, the, the multiple that you brought up, I think it's incredibly important. I happened to read this morning the same story about the, the, uh, the, the, the depiction of, of, uh, of Muhammad uh, in, in a classroom at this college I never heard of, but uh, clearly a, a, a place that is nervous about uh, reaction. Um, you know, th there's a lot of sensitivity in America at the moment, a heightened, inappropriately heightened sensitivity to missteps in the classroom. And uh, I'm frankly very troubled by this episode because um, even, even scholars of Islam report that, that uh, uh, there, there's a strong difference of opinion within the Muslim community about depictions of, of Muhammad. And if, uh, you know, if we can't engage people in an open discussion, don't, don't, it doesn't lead to the firing. This person was not just punished, he was fired. Uh, and uh, that you know, completely outrageous violation of free speech. Um, all of us who teach undergraduates do live in a certain kind of, of, of fear at the moment because uh, college administrators can be overly concerned about the loss of financial support from governments or from donors because they violate some precept held by a few people. And I, I worry that, that, uh, uh, that the need to try to avoid any controversy is overwhelming the importance of of open speech and open dialogue in in classes. I, I, uh, I I'm very conscious as I teach an undergraduate courses that if I cross a certain line and say something inappropriate, I might be disbarred. And uh, I think this example is worth thinking about. I don't, you know, I don't think about this in the same way as I thought we were going to be talking uh, discussing. Uh, interdisciplinary study, um, but I do agree that that uh, this question of of 
remaining open, not just to the, the simple utility of having multiple disciplines and multiple points of view um, be directed to a sim single problem, but to, to the worry that, that uh, a violation of uh, some standard by saying something unusual is going to lead to repercussions that we're going to regret. So, uh, I agree entirely with the, with, with the question, with the issues you raised about race. That um, it's, it's been, it seems to be a long time that um, we've been all saying that race is not, not a biological concept, but we don't want to deny the idea that there's race. That race is out there. People do character, you know, characterize people in simplistic ways, and they characterize themselves that way. Uh, I think about this problem uh, particularly in the context of a project that's underway, uh, partly under my direction, at the New York Genome Center, where we're trying to understand the relationship of heredity to cancer. And one of the things there's been a lot of uh, dramatic. Um, advance in understanding cancer by looking at the mutations that occur during life that drive cancers, much less attention to the inherited variations that we all recognize, uh, like mutations in the BRCA1 genes or mutations in the P53 gene that can in in change your likelihood of developing cancer. But we have not made a, a, a much broader approach to the way in which uh, the, 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 the millions of variations between your genome and my genome might influence our risks of cancer. Um, and to do that, you have to begin to look at a, a much larger segment of the population. One thing we know, even from the very primitive um, char char characterization of origins that the US government requires us to, to or allows us to uh, to put onto data like African American, African, Hispanic, non-Hispanic, black, non-Hispanic, white. Um, those are incredibly primitive racial categories that don't really inform things. But um, but even if you just use those simplistic categories, you can see in a moment that uh, that. The, the samples in our databases are 80%, 85% white. Now, white has a lot of connotations, too. It, um, uh, a person who calls himself white from Canada and someone who calls themselves white from, from uh, South America, they're, very, they're, they're going to be very different. I don't, no doubt about that. But, but uh, the point is that, that there's a kind of... Um, privilege and discrimination that's exerted on patient populations who were included in studies. And one of the things we're trying to do is to enlarge the, the database with respect to even this simplistic definition of race by ensuring that the number of patients who, who have um, their, their genome studied and the, the risks that they have as individuals born with a certain set of genetic instructions are taken into consideration. Um, we prefer the term ancestry because that reflects what the, the genetic contributions of the last few hundred years. Um, and I hope that uh, by taking the kinds of points of view you, that you uh, articulated, that we'll soon begin to think about um, ancestry and the place that is very primitive and simplistic conceptions of race. Um, there are a lot of other things said here. I think I'd like to just stop and...